Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, so uh, welcome to this uh, first course on algebraic geometry. So <coughs> let me uh, begin by uh, 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 trying to tell you uh, what algebraic geometry is all about uh, in the in its greatest generality. It is trying to study the uh, geometry of the set of common zeros of a bunch of polynomials. Okay, so uh, uh, so you know so let me write that down. So that is uh, that is in uh, that is in one line what algebraic geometry is. Okay, so um, so beginning with this, uh, uh, let's try to uh, take the discussion further. So when I say a set of polynomials, of course uh, uh, I should I should tell you uh, where these polynomials are from. Okay, and then uh, I should also tell you uh, 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 by that I mean I should tell you. Uh, these are form polynomials in how many variables okay so you must have a fixed number of variables and then i should also tell you uh, about the coefficients of these polynomials because of course for example we are used to writing polynomials over real numbers which means polynomials with real coefficients and uh, for example also with uh, complex coefficients okay or sometimes we also look at polynomials that with just integer coefficients okay so the coefficients usually come from a ring okay so uh, so what is happening is that you see in this way uh, the ring of polynomials in several variables uh, over a given ring comes into the picture okay so you see so what you do is uh, so we so we pick uh, uh, or rather we are given I should not say we pick so we are given So we are given a collection of polynomials. Uh, 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 let me say a subset of polynomials. So let me write them as f sub alpha of x one, etc., x n. S is the set of all polynomials f sub alpha uh, x1 etc xn and this is uh, each one of these f alphas is a polynomial uh, in a polynomial ring okay. So this ring is uh, the ring the competitive ring that consists of polynomials in the variables x1 through xn and with coefficients in the competitive ring r. 
okay. So of course I will not repeat this often uh, we are always going to be worried only about commutative rings and uh, commutative rings are uh, assumed to be with a unit element that is with 1 and we will always assume that homomorphisms of commutative rings carry 1 to 1 okay. So uh, so R is a commutative ring with 1 okay uh, and uh, x1 through xn are variables n variables and this is the polynomial ring over R in n variables and each f sub alpha is a polynomial uh, in this ring and you take some of these uh, uh, a subset of these polynomials so this is alpha is some indexing set uh, let me put it as uh, lambda if you want okay uh, in which case I can uh, rather change the index to small lambda for more coherence. So this S, uh, uh, S is a subset of uh, the, ring, the ring of polynomials in n variables over R okay uh, and and we want and we want to study the geometry of the subset of the subset z of s the set of common zeros of s and that is defined to be the set of all uh, r1 etc rn n tuples of elements of r okay so this is this is just r cross r n times this is just the Cartesian product of R taken with itself n times. So these are n tuples of elements of R. Each one, each R i is an element of small R i is an element of capital R. Such that the uh, if you plug in x i equal to R i, okay. That is, if you substitute for x i the corresponding R i in this tuple, okay. Or in other words, if you substitute for the tuple. Uh, x1 etc xn the values r1 etc rn in that order then you will get a and when you evaluate this polynomial okay then you will get uh, an element of r and that has to be 0 and that should happen for every lambda okay then and only then is a point of rn in this set okay. So, uh, so such that uh, f lambda of r1 etc rn is 0 for every lambda belonging to capital R okay. So, um, so maybe this I will just write it as such that okay. So, so you see so basically what is happening is that uh, you already have uh, you already have uh, 2 objects here on the one hand you have uh, uh, R n, which is uh, R cross R cross R n times, okay. And uh, on the other hand, you also have uh, the polynomial ring over R in n variables, okay. And what is happening is that uh, I am given a subset S of the polynomial ring and I am associating to that subset uh, the set of common zeros of that subset which is a subset of Rn okay. So uh, and uh, the purpose of algebraic geometry is uh, to study the geometry of this common set of zeros okay. So this is the general picture. So to so you you can see that already there are two sides to the picture there is one side which is the geometric side okay where you have the space where you the space where you are looking at the zeros okay and you have here the algebraic side which consists of essentially you are uh, the looking at the polynomial ring okay so you can already see that there is a there is a commutative algebra side and there is an algebraic geometry side so algebraic geometry is all about going from this to that and that to this uh, uh, based on uh, uh, properties on both sides. For example uh, you could have 
properties of this set which are geometric properties okay and they would translate uh, into some properties connected on this side and the properties that are connected on this side are ring theoretic properties or which may be ring theoretic properties or they in therefore they could be ideal theoretic properties or more generally uh, they could also be module theoretic properties okay because modern competitive algebra is not just the study of uh, rings and ideals but it is also the study of modules because module the notion of a module generalizes the notion of an ideal and also that of a vector space at the same time and is is more is more versatile okay so uh, the properties on this side are geometric properties the properties on that side are competitive algebra properties and it's this dictionary it's setting up this dictionary uh, uh, which is the subject of algebraic geometry okay and uh, but of course there are several things that i'll have to explain to you first of all uh, i haven't uh, 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 so so let me write that here so this is the this is the geometric side and this is the commutative algebraic side okay and uh, uh, in some sense therefore you can say that uh, algebraic geometry and commutative algebra are kind of married to each other in that sense okay they are two sides of the same coin okay so uh, but then i'll have to explain to you what do you mean by uh, uh, what do you mean by the geometry of a subset okay because uh, that involves several things but uh, for example uh, it's at the base level it will involve some topology and then on top of that it will involve further properties topological properties and on top of that it will involve some uh, properties connected with manifold theoretic properties okay and so on and so forth which we will try to explain uh, but let me uh, let me at this point uh, uh, go to uh, something else okay so first of all you know if you give me an equation like this forget even a set of equations suppose i give you even a single equation over a ring okay it might turn out that this set may be empty okay that is the problem this set if it is going to be empty it does not there is nothing interesting to study because there is nothing to study first of all. So that can happen uh, uh, um, uh, very easily for example you know if you take the ring r to be real numbers and you know if I take something like uh, uh, just one variable okay and if I take the and if I call that variable so I just take real numbers uh, with one variable x1 and if I take the equation x1 squared plus 1 then you know that it has no zeros in real numbers okay because uh, obviously you know because the the zeros are non real they, they are complex okay so in so it's very possible that if you work over a general ring okay you are uh, you you are th this particular set the zero set can turn out to be empty and then you are there's nothing to study okay so so at this point uh, uh, at this point there is a I should say a dichotomy uh, 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 the subject actually uh, breaks into uh, or rather can be divided into two parts. So there is there is one question that tells you that uh, uh, if if you are if you are going to work over rings such that this is never going to be empty okay then uh, of course you have uh, uh, that's a, these are good rings over which you can you can do uh, you can you can do this kind of study okay the other thing is uh, is the question that uh, uh, what do you do if uh, this uh, uh, ring doesn't have those properties uh, so the the answer to that is th there is an answer uh, to both so uh, if you uh, so the 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 first question the first uh, the first part is you restrict to rings which are algebraically closed fields okay if you re restrict to rings which are algebraically closed fields then this set is never empty for uh, decent collection of polynomials okay I will explain what decent means later and you can do geometry okay so that is called variety theory and that is what is usually done in a first course in algebraic geometry then the other thing is what do you do with a general ring okay for example I would like to have I would like to work over the integers for example you know questions like Fermat's last theorem 
it also involves uh, an equation in three variables it is an equation with coefficients in integers and then you are trying to ask whether there are non trivial integer solutions apart from the easy solutions okay. Uh, then you also need to solve questions like that and to solve questions like that of course uh, uh, there are there are equations over integers which do not have solutions for example x square plus 1 equal to 0 is very well an equation with integer questions and it has no solutions in integers it does not have any solutions even in real numbers. So how can it have solutions even in integers so the question is how do you deal with such things so there is a part of algebraic geometry a slightly more sophisticated area of algebraic geometry which deals with such things and that is called scheme theory and this scheme theory is uh, is is the is the uh, it is a modern language of algebraic geometry and uh, that is usually what is covered in a second course in algebraic geometry because it involves far more uh, machinery okay but what we will be doing this course is that we will be safely restricting ourselves to the cases when this set is is non empty okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to tell you something about i'm going to tell you something about solving equations or rather uh, uh, okay zeros zeros of equations so uh, well so the first thing is uh, you know uh, uh, as you would have come across in any first course in algebra uh, normally the uh, usually we start with integers and then you know you extend them to rational numbers well of course you could also take natural numbers before this okay you can uh, well maybe I can even do that it is not a big deal uh, I can I can take natural numbers then I can extend them to integers then there are there is a field of rational numbers then there is a field of real numbers there is a field of complex numbers this is how it goes and every time you uh, you have a bigger number system and that is because uh, uh, essentially you want to solve equations so number systems become bigger and bigger because you have some equations for which you do not have solutions so you have to make that make this make your set of numbers bigger okay so you know for example uh, natural numbers uh, the counting numbers 1 2 3 4 does not have 0 so an equation like x plus 1 equal to 1 which has a solution x equal to 0 uh, will not uh, have a solution here and uh, and an equation like x plus 1 equal to 2 or I mean x plus 1 equal to uh, or rather x plus 2 equal to 1 which is a solution x equal to minus 1 also does not have a solution here so you are forced to go to integers and then uh, you can have an equation of integers which does not have a solution in integers which have a solution only in rational numbers for example things like 2x equal to 3 it is very well an equation over integers okay. Uh, but the solution is x equal to x equal 2x equal to 3 the solution is x equal to 3 by 2 which is a rational number so you have to extend so finally what happens is that you see that you come to fields and you come to field extensions okay and the point is that every time you ask the question uh, when you get a bigger number system you ask the question well if i write a polynomial uh, in that uh, with with that coefficients will the zeros of the polynomial always lie there and if the answer is yes at some point then that is called an algebraically closed field okay. So uh, uh, so the fact is C is an algebraically closed field okay C is an algebraically closed field so and uh, and what does this mean that is uh, so so that is <coughs> any polynomial in one variable with C coefficients has uh, a 0 in C <coughs> okay so and in fact uh, you know if uh, a polynomial has a 0 uh, if you call the polynomial as fx f of x of course it is one variable so I should just call it as f of x where x is a variable and if it has a uh, 
0 which means it has a value lambda uh, such that f of lambda equal to 0 then you know x minus lambda is a factor of the polynomial and by division by the division algorithm you know that <coughs> the polynomial becomes uh, x minus lambda times another polynomial of lower degree of 1 degree less okay and <coughs> in this way you can continue and well uh, the the polynomial of lower degree that you get that also uh, will have a 0 in 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 the complex numbers and you can factor that linear factor out and if you do like this what it will tell you is that finally any polynomial uh, can be completely split into linear factors okay that is what it says and this is the property of uh, the field of complex numbers which uh, makes it algebraically closed and in general this is the definition of what an algebraically closed field is an algebraically closed field is a field such that you take any single polynomial in one variable over that field then all its zeros are in that field that it means that you can find all the zeros in the field itself you do not have to extend the field you do not have to extend your number system to something bigger where you will get the zeros okay so so basically what it tells you is that uh, you know uh, if you are so what it tells you if you go back to our our setup what it tells you is that if I take uh, r equal to c if I take my ring to be c which is in fact a uh, field okay and if I take n equal to 1 <coughs> then I have c here and here I will have c of x okay polynomial ring in one variable and then it tells you that you give me uh, if you give me a single polynomial if this s this set s is a single polynomial then the 0 set of that is is, is non empty in fact it will have uh, the number of zeros will be equal to degree the degree of the polynomial but of course you have to count the zeros with multiplicity okay you have to count the zeros with multiplicity after all the polynomial may be x minus 1 to the power of 5 okay and then uh, well uh, if you want to if you want to count the zeros with multiplicity then you can think of them as 5 zeros but uh, well uh, if you think of it as a subset here you get only one point namely the point 1 okay so so what this tells you is uh, if you are working on an algebraically closed field and there is only one variable involved and you are looking at only one polynomial then uh, you end up in a situation where this set is non set is non empty okay. Now the question is mind you our original question is we are not looking at a single polynomial we are looking at a bunch of polynomials okay and this need not even be finite this collection of polynomials need not even be finite and not only that we are not looking at a polynomial in one variable we are looking at a polynomial in several variables okay what the algebraic closure property tells you is that if you are looking at a polynomial in one variable and if your coefficient ring is an algebraically closed field then if you look at the zeros of a single polynomial then it is not going to be empty okay but we want something very very general to happen okay the answer to that is so you might expect that should you put something more some more conditions than just the field being algebraically closed for such a thing to happen and the answer is no the amazing answer is yes the the, 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 the may amazing answer is this itself will ensure that so long as this set s is good in a decent way uh, if r is an algebraically closed field then z of s can never be empty okay and this is a very deep fact and this is called the the uh, this is one form of the hilbert nullstall and such okay so so let me so let me uh, so let me write that down so so uh, so fact so uh, 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 if if we take uh, uh, for r uh, an algebraically closed field Uh, then for f in uh, rx z, z of f is non empty uh, of course uh, provided provided f is non constant of course you know when uh, when you are looking at zeros of a polynomial certainly you are not looking at a constant polynomial okay uh, 
uh, what that means is if you are looking at a constant polynomial if that constant is non zero then there are no zeros and if that constant is zero then the whole space satisfies the condition okay so if you take a non zero constant and consider that as a polynomial then it has no zeros so its zero set is empty if you take zero as a constant polynomial then its zero set is a whole space okay so what it says is that if you take for r an algebraically closed field and this set s to be a singleton consisting of only one polynomial which is uh, of course non constant then the zero set is non empty so you ensure that this is non empty so you can do some geometry okay but then here is here is the here is the important thing so what we want is uh, not for one variable x but we want it for several variables and uh, we don't want it for a single polynomial in several variables but we want it for a whole collection of polynomials in several variables okay so that is the that is the that is our deep requirement and that's what uh, the null stellenzatz as it is called uh, hilbert's null stellenzatz that's what uh, it promises so so let me write the following down so first let me say the following thing uh, suppose uh, suppose so here is a here is a very simple uh, let me call it a lemma I will write a very simple lemma um, uh, if uh, uh, the set yes is such that uh, uh, that does not that that does not exist a finite subset uh, let me write f lambda 1 f sub lambda m and polynomials g lambda 1 g lambda m in the in the polynomial ring such that sigma f lambda i g lambda i is equal to 1 i equal to 1 to m then uh, so I should say uh, and only then uh, so I should say the following thing so there is one part of the lemma which is very trivial there is the other part of the lemma which uh, is actually the null schlansatz when r is an algebraically closed field so let me say that correctly I have to modify this statement a little bit uh, yeah. <coughs> so so let me let me make a small modification if the set s is such that uh, uh, is that of s uh, is non empty then there cannot exist a finite subset such that this is equal to 1 so this is a statement okay so i'm saying that suppose uh, so we so you see uh, the whole point is the following the whole point is we are trying to look we are trying to uh, we are trying to study this set of common zeros okay we don't want that to be empty we don't want that to be empty and the statement i'm making is that if it is non empty then no finitely no finite subset of s can generate 1 okay no finite subset of s can generate 1 that means you cannot get finitely many elements of s and finitely many polynomials from the ring of which this capital s is a subset of such that you take multiply them and then add them you get 1 that cannot happen that is obvious because you see if 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 the 0 set is is non empty that means there is a value small r1 etc small rn in the 0 set and this value small r1 etc small rn when you substitute it in each of these f lambdas it is going to vanish okay so in particular if i substitute it in this relation uh, on the left side okay the left side is going to vanish 
and I will get 0 equal to 1 and uh, in a ring if 0 equal to 1 then the ring is a 0 ring okay it has only one element which is 0 ring and certainly we are not interested in working with a 0 ring okay. So if the ring is not the 0 ring then uh, what this tells you is that if the 0 set is non empty this can never happen okay it is obvious this is a very very simple thing okay. But the converse to this uh, that the converse to this holds when the ring is an algebraically closed field is the is one form of the Hilbert null schlansatz so uh, so let me write that the converse is true uh, if r is an algebraically closed field and that is that is the uh, uh, that is that is one form of the Hilbert Hilbert null schlansatz so maybe so let me keep it like this let me keep it like this let me not state it the converse will be that uh, if the subset s if r is an algebraically closed field and if the subset s of polynomials in the polynomial ring over r in n variables is such that no finite subset of that can generate one then the zero set defined by that subset is non empty okay that is one form of the null schlansatz which is usually called the weak form of the null schlansatz okay so uh, of the null schlansatz so so maybe i'll write it down so uh, so let what is that so if k is an algebraically closed field and s is a subset of polynomials over k in n variables of course small n is greater than or equal to 1 okay then such that such that that does not exist a finite subset subset uh, let me write f1 etc fm in s and polynomials so let me continue here g1 etc gm so this is m uh, again in the same ring such that sigma f i g i uh, is equal to 1 i equal to 1 to m then the zero set defined by s in uh, in kn is non empty you can find solutions see what you must understand is that uh, the hilbert null schlansatz is a grand uh, generalization of the property of being algebraically closed you know if i put in the hilbert null schlansatz if I put small yeah, n equal to 1 then I am looking at polynomials only in one variable and if I take the subset S capital S to be a singleton set okay then this statement is obviously true if for an algebraically closed field. See the what you must understand is Hilbert's null schlansatz when you put n equal to 1 is true 
just by the definition of algebraically closed field because what happens when you put n equal to 1 you and when you take uh, the set S to be uh, a singleton consisting of only one polynomial and then if you have this condition that then this condition will become that polynomial multiplied by no other polynomial gives you 1 which is the same as saying that that polynomial is non constant okay. Then you are saying that the zeros of that polynomial in k1 which is just k exist so you are just saying that every polynomial has a 0 which is the definition of what an algebraically closed field is. So what you must understand is that Hilbert's null Stellenstadt starts is a is a is a is a grand generalization of the definition of algebraically closed and uh, it is a very very important theorem and this is the theorem that guarantees that if you are working over algebraically closed fields then you can really do geometry okay. So uh, th and this is called the weak form we will come to the stronger form later on okay um, and I will see later on if if I can uh, uh, hint at a proof of the uh, Hilbert null Stellenstadt usually a proof of the null Stellenstadt is given um, in a course in commutative algebra but then there is also a way of looking at that proof uh, completely in algebraic geometric terms. So this is something that keeps happening that you must always keep at the back of your mind there are many things that uh, can be said in this on, on the language on this side which is a la algebraic geometry language and this uh, there are the same things can be said with the language on this side which is a language of uh, commutative rings and modules and ideals and things like that okay. So uh, proof here uh, will involve uh, uh, you know ring theoretic arguments ideals and homomorphisms and modules and things like that <coughs> whereas <coughs> the same proof when you translate it here it will have a geometric meaning and it is it is this it is trying to go from one to the other that really enriches uh, both the sides okay. So <coughs> okay so incidentally I should tell you what this null Stellen Sartre says so uh, no this is this is German I mean you know Hilbert uh, was a uh, German mathematician and of course uh, of one of the greatest uh, of all time and uh, null stands for 0 and Stella stands for position or point and Sartre means theorem or statement. So it is actually so if you translate it uh, uh, properly it means Hilbert's, uh, uh, Hilbert's theorem on zeros uh, on zeros of polynomials uh, of a bunch of polynomials okay fine so um, okay so so what we are going to do is so so from now on now on we will always work uh, over an algebraically closed field k that is that is that is we take r equal to k. So if you want uh, for convenience you can uh, even think of the algebraically closed field as complex numbers so that you know uh, if it makes uh, <coughs> it easier for you to think about uh, things and visualize things okay. So uh, so what we are going to do so, so our picture becomes uh, so, so, the, so our picture uh, goes from that generality into something uh, more concrete so we have uh, so we have the following picture uh, on the on the commutative algebra side <coughs> we have k of x1 etc xn this is the polynomial ring in n variables and on the geometric side we have uh, kn which is k cross k cross k <coughs> n times okay. Now uh, well um, how do you think of kn uh, you, you are used to kn from 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 linear algebra I mean the always uh, one would the simplest way one would look at it is as a vector space of dimension n okay. Uh, for people who have done uh, uh, module theory uh, rn cannot can be thought of as the n dimensional free module over r okay. So uh, uh, in fact we do not use the word dimension for modules uh, so I should amend my statement to rn is the free module of rank n over r okay uh, so dimension is usually reserved for fields so kn is an n dimensional 
uh, vector space over k a module over a field is a vector space okay. So uh, but it is not the vector space properties we are interested in so you see the vector space uh, the properties of vector space are you have the 0 vector and then you know uh, you have addition of vectors and so on and so forth. So in so in that sense uh, you know uh, the vector space studying the vector space properties is literally studying linear algebra but that is not what we are interested in what we are interested in is actually trying to study uh, the points of the space okay without any regard to the vector properties okay. So you so it means that all points of the space are alike I mean if you take the plane and throw away the vector space structure that means you take the plane and how do you get the vector space structure you have to first uh, have an origin because for a vector you need an initial point and then you need a terminal point. So normally what we do is we have an origin and every other point uh, to every other point we associate the vector which starts at the origin and goes to that point we call it the position vector of that point and then we study all these position vectors and add them as usual with parallelogram law and then so on and so forth. But what we are going to do now is not call any not worry about uh, doing all this we are going to think of all points as equal as one and the same. So think of k n but do not think of the axis do not think of the origin as the origin of the vector. So you just think of it for example if n is equal to 2 think of the plane but without the 2 axis there is a point called the origin but that point is not uh, you do not you do not try to for every other point you do not try to draw a pos position vector and think of it as a vector. So you know this this uh, 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 this process of trying to think of k n as a space not of points but not as a space of vectors is what makes it makes it into what is called an affine space okay. So the affine space k n is different from the vector space k n in the affine space we are only worried about the points not about the vectors okay. So you will see often in algebraic geometry people use the word affine and that is the whole point okay. So the first important thing is do not ever think of these as vectors okay though it is a vector space of dimension n but that is not what we want right. So well so this is the affine space literally and given a subset s you get uh, the 0 set of uh, oops uh, yeah that is right here. So here is our uh, here is our uh, uh, this is the picture we are going to look at and we are going to see uh, what is there on both sides okay. So the first thing that I am going to do is uh, uh, so that brings us to the following question that brings us to the following question um, what, are go what are we going to do with this uh, with this set we have we have we have thrown away the vector space structure it is just a set now what are you going to do with it. So the first step is to give it a topology okay and that topology is called the Zariski topology okay. So I will explain what that topology is so well uh, so let me write that so let me write the following thing k n along with the Zariski topology is called affine n space over k and denoted a n k okay. So the first thing that we do uh, uh, to get some geometry on the left side is first of all have at least a topological space okay. So we make k n into a topological space what does that mean it means that uh, you have to specify a topology on it and uh, specifying a topology on it means what uh, you try to uh, give a collection of subsets which are which you may call as open subsets and this collection has to satisfy the axioms for a topology and what are the axioms for a topology the whole space should be an open set the null set or the which is the empty set should be uh, an open set an arbitrary union of open sets should be open a finite intersection of open sets must be open. So these are the four conditions for a uh, collection of subsets of a topology uh, of, a, of a space uh, or uh, of a set to make it into a topological space okay. So uh, so what so I so I will have to explain what the open sets are okay but then you know in when you go to topology 
there are there are two ways to approaching a topology one way is by open sets the other way is by using closed sets okay because closed sets are just complements of open sets so i can also give a topology on a set by giving a collection of subsets called closed sets but then the conditions will be complementary okay because of de morgan's laws so the conditions will be that uh, uh, the whole space is a closed set then the empty set that is the null set is a closed set any if you take a finite collection of closed sets their union is again a closed set okay and uh, if you take uh, an arbitrary collection of closed sets their intersection is again a closed set these are just translations using de morgan's laws for the corresponding axioms for open sets so basically what i'll have to do is that i have to tell you either i should either give you a collection of open sets or i should give you a collection of closed sets which satisfy the corresp corresponding axioms and what happens in geometry is that is easier to begin with by looking at collections of closed sets and guess what what are going to be the closed sets the closed sets are going to be just common zeros of uh, uh, functions of this type so you see the so the high so the idea is the following you look at this space the look at kn think of these as functions on kn of course uh, you take any polynomial here and you take a point here if you evaluate the polynomial at that point you get a value so certainly a polynomial the elements here which are polynomials here are certainly functions on this space and what you do is you call uh, uh, a subset here to be closed if it is the uh, in the zero locus common zero locus of a bunch of polynomial functions which is exactly what this is okay so the moral of the story is that if you declare subsets of kn of this form zero loci of a bunch of polynomials common zero loci of a bunch of polynomials call them as closed sets then you get the zariski topology that makes this kn into zariski topology so what that will tell you is that uh, uh, what are the open sets the open sets will be loci uh, where certain where functions don't vanish the loci where the functions vanish for example the loci where uh, locus where a single function vanishes is a closed set and the complement of that locus where the single function does not vanish is an open set okay and this is in tune with our common sense okay because uh, if you take a real valued function on uh, some subset of rn or you take a complex valued function with uh, on a subset of uh, n dimensional complex space cn then uh, this, uh, the set of points where the function takes the value zero uh, is going to be a closed set provided the function is a continuous function because it is inverse a point is always a closed subset and if a function is continuous the inverse image of a closed subset is closed therefore the set of points where the function is zero is exactly the inverse image of the point which is zero and that has to be closed okay so it agrees with our usual intuition so the idea is to give the zariski topology in that way okay so we will we'll, uh, look at that in more detail in the next lecture